William Faulkner knew that most writers should have a job that supports them as a writer, that they shouldn't be dreaming of becoming a full-time author, because in 2024, we have careerified everything, and we think that we can't sustain a full-time job, a family, and also be a writer. But that has been disproven by so many authors in the past who were struggling physically and economically way worse than we ever will. And today we are going to hear William Faulkner speak at length on why writers should get a job. And here on Write Conscious, we talk about William Faulkner. In the playlist down below, you will find videos on Faulkner's life, his books, and his writing philosophy, and that playlist is growing every single week. But enough for me. Let us now hear from Faulkner. Don't make writing your work. Get another job so you'll have money to buy the things you want in life. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you don't count on money and a deadline for your writing. You'll be able to find plenty of time for writing, no matter how much your job takes, how much time your job takes. I've never met anyone who couldn't find enough time to write what he wanted. And Faulkner is 100% correct here. And so there are multiple layers of this because Faulkner wrote as I, as I lay dying in a power plant in 48 days and he would spend part of his shift writing the novel and said that he only had to change one word in revision after it was done, which is crazy. And that may just be him flexing, but we should analyze this situation really fast because yes, working in a power plant is very hard, but how the hell did Faulkner find hours to write his novel at that job every single night? And so the two things that I would say, the three things that you need if you want to be a writer in 2024 and what you need to get right, or I guarantee you that you will fail are this. First and foremost, you need a positive mentality about yourself or at least a belief in yourself at some level, or most likely you will just be swallowed up by the other 4 million books that are published every single year. Long gone is the days of John Kennedy Toole and Franz Kafka and Emily Dickinson, where you can be the forgotten genius who just gets discovered. Like that is an illusion. Second, you need a job that actually supports your work, meaning not monetarily, but energetically. And then third, you need a partner a relationship partner that is, that is going to support you also. Because I would also say that long gone are the days where you can try and consider consider yourself the best novelist. There are, are a couple people out there who are competing to be the best literary fiction authors of all time. But for people like you and I, we are competing in a different realm. We are trying to transform people. We are trying to move people through our art in a certain sub-niche section of the market. And so on this channel, I don't advocate that you biohack and optimize your life so that you can write more and have more energy, even though you probably should do that. Because first and foremost, a big part of human existence is human relationships or the lack of them. Because if you want to be a hermit, I 100% understand that. But you shouldn't be watching me online right now. You should be totally divorced from technology. You should be a hermit. You shouldn't be an asshole incel and projecting all your negativity out on the world. But then we have human relationships. And the other day, I was talking to a friend of mine from my yoga days because I have been a yoga teacher for 13 years now. But at one point, it was my full-time job. And so I met a bunch of really crazy and really awesome people. But one of my friends is now a part of a commune because of his sister. Because he was a welder in Las Vegas and his sister, who was also very, sp was very spiritual, got involved with this group. And they basically asked him, like, hey, you have all these technical skills. You know how to make things. Instead of just running in circles and living in an apartment in Las Vegas, you want to come live on our farm. And I understand it's pretty crazy and I want to do it, but he went, on, he went along and did it. And his sister has been a part of this community for like, let's say 15 years. And she's at the point where she's, and this is a spiritual community that's been going on for decades. And his sister rose to the top of the community, but the elders of this group will not allow her to have a leadership position even though she has the rank and knowledge because she has been able to sustain a long-term relationship and she's almost 40 years old. And they, you know, they tell her, hey, you're living on a commune. There are plenty of single men around here and you've dated a lot of them and you haven't been able to make it work. Is it your problem, their problem, or is it your problem? And so my personal opinion is in 2024, you need to have a job that supports you and you need to have a romantic, yes, a romantic relationship, unless you're just going to go full hermit, for full celibate, which is cool too, that supports you. And if you haven't been able to work that out, then you should, and if that, if you haven't been able to work out a job or relationship that supports your writing, then you need to spend some time not focusing on your writing and fixing that. There may be a transition period. 
And so what jobs are best for writers? Obviously ones where you can read and write on the job or that have little to no stress because I get emails all the time and people hear me go on these rants and they're like, I work in the military, you know, I work 60 hours a week and I do 12 hour shifts five days in a row and I'm living on a boat and I only have this much time off. And I want to tell them like, hey man, you should just relax, read some books, take care of yourself and not worry about being a writer because you are under a ton of duress. And I know I'm supposed to do that. Everyone can write thing and follow Faulkner's lead. And I'm a very optimistic person and, you know, you know, I'm into personal development. I listen to motivational shit all day in my headphones and that's how I get a lot of stuff done. But every time I talk to those guys and I have friendships, relationships with some of those people, they don't get anything done. Like they try to and they try to grind it out, but eventually they burn out. And so really fast, let's talk about the best job for writers in 2024. And unfortunately, it's the same as it's always been. And I don't recommend any of these three options because it feels like cheating. And we'll get to the real options in a second. But obviously, illegal activity, finding a sugar sugar mama or sugar daddy, having your parents fund the project, or working for your parents or for someone in a hookup job, those are the three easiest ways to fund yourself as an artist and always have been. But most of us aren't willing to do that or have even the option to do that. So instead, we need to view this whole situation through a new lens. And the first thing that your job should do is not create such a deep sense of dread that it is absolutely draining to you. When you come home, you should be somewhat happy. And yes, you're like, yes, I'm wasting my life. I'm wasting my time. But you should feel energized because obviously working as a night hotel clerk and being able to write eight hours for the entire time is optimum. But if you need to make a certain amount of money or do something, you should be working for a company and in a culture that is generally supportive, even though most of the time they are exploiting you. Because as a teacher, I never get to write on the job. I'm always dealing with some form of pandemonium or or teaching, but I do read a lot. Like for instance, for the past two weeks, I've had some of my classes listen to Pink Floyd's The Wall in full. And then we're comparing that to Hemingway's Nick Adams stories and showing how trauma is created in the modern world. That is very energizing to me. Like that is what I love to do. And so when I come home, I'm ready to make more videos. I'm ready to write and do stuff like that. But I've specifically found a school, a group of kids, a place that will support that. Back at my school, uh, one of my old schools I taught at in Las Vegas, I would come home every single day feeling like I wanted to kill myself. It was so bad. I mean, I was getting treated so poorly, not just by the kids, but by my bosses and felt like the community at large. That I had to leave, but it actually took me years and uh, uh, and, and actually switching multiple schools to be able to find somewhere that supported me. And so when you're looking at your life, if this seems unrealistic, yes, you may have to make some sacrifices. Yes, it may be a bit crazy. Yes, you know, leaving your job and trying to find something better in a very volatile, volatile job market is an insane risk, especially if you have a, if you have family and kids. But the wealthiest place in the world, the, the place with the greatest novels ever written is the graveyard. There are so many authors, so many people who have I've, who I've personally known who've given up their writing dreams. I knew this girl back at college named Callie who was an amazing writer, had been doing it her entire life, but because she didn't see this kind of like economic opportunity and couldn't figure out how to get a job or do any of this, she listened to her parents and joined the military and she's not written a word since. Like I swear to God, this chick who was probably 20 years old at the time was writing better Then our professor who had sold, you know, 75,000 books at that point. And just from university alone, I know probably 50 to 60 writers who've just given up, who were talented. But I know they haven't given up completely. I know in their head when they see me talking online or they read a book, they're like, I could do this. And that's one of my interpretations of Frankenstein, that Victor has created this monster. This was this beautiful piece of him, this genius breakthrough of his artistic creation. And he rejects it. He faints. He continues to reject it. And he doesn't make a double for Frankenstein. And he runs away. And when you run away from your artistic goals and ambitions and talent, it eventually consumes you and kills you. And funny enough, that idea right there is how I met my wife. Like we already knew each other at university, but we were in a class and I got up and did this whole rant about Victor's genius and connected it to German idealism and philosophy. And the whole class was upset at me, but she was smiling at me and nodding her head. And everyone else was like freaking out because they saw Victor as this misogynist dummy. (laughs) Because coming back to the quote, Faulkner is right that there are some people who can find plenty of time to write no matter how much time their job takes because there are people who have the it factor. There are the people who can work 12 five-hour shifts and have a family and do all that and sit down for three hours and make it happen. 
I was talking to someone the other day on the free calls I do over on my writing school. Everyone, if you want to join my writing school, it is free. And if you want to get into William Faulkner over in my book club, we are going to start reading As I Lay Dying, which is, I think, the best work to start with if you've never read Faulkner before. In the next week or two, over on my Substack, my Substack also has free posts that are too meta or too controversial for YouTube. And I also have a free guide down below to William Faulkner. But there are guys, so the other day I was talking to someone and they say that at their job for eight hours, they can't work. They're basically doing like retail or something. So in their head, they craft scenes and they can memorize around 200 words. So they perfectly craft a scene at work over the course of eight hours. That's around 200 words. So when they get home, they write that down immediately, which is insane. And then they start writing. So they already have a 200 word head start when they get home from work every day. But when I was talking to that guy, he had this fire. He had this kind of it factor in his eyes. And not everyone has that. It's this weird genetic thing. But most authors actually did not have that. They had to cultivate it. And so there are the outliers who can make it happen. But in general, Faulkner is speaking from a position of immense talent. And so for you, if you're going to make this happen, you need as much energy. And I would say time, you know, is less important, but you need as much energy as possible to tackle this stuff. Because sleepy writing most of the time honestly isn't very good. I've done it before. You guys have maybe done it before. I've known the people who have grinded and cut sleep and it reads very flat. And so we love to idolize these individuals like Faulkner or even like a Cormac McCarthy. But Cormac McCarthy, even when he became rich, when he got his MacArthur Fellowship, which is like getting a million dollars today, he still wasn't famous yet, but he was known for having his house in El Paso. And if you came over, there would just be always an ongoing construction project. The entire front room would be taken apart, the bathroom. And basically... His house in El Paso was unfinished his entire time he was living there. He could live with a construction project going on that wasn't going to get completed for two years and multiple of them in his house. Most of us are not like that. Most of us have at least some standard for how we're trying to live and we don't have that like aura that McCarthy had. And unfortunately, we live in a time where things are much more expensive because of inflation and many other things. And so we don't have the opportunity to travel around for cheap like McCarthy did and especially feel safe like McCarthy and even Faulkner did all this traveling to places that would be considered dangerous today and they were welcomed. And so I agree that you should never count on money for your stuff, especially your books. And that's why in, over in my free, free writing school and the philosophy that I preach is that you need to separate your legacy novels, your, your books, and your online writing because online writing is meant to reach people. It has the ability to scale, to be read by tens of thousands of people, no matter what genre you're in. And it's about 100 times easier to get 1,000 people to pay you $5 a month for some of your shorter writing than it is to get 12,000 people to buy one of your books every single year, especially if you're writing in the literary fiction genre. If you're writing fantasy or sci-fi, that's easy. It's easy to trick a bunch of desperate dudes living in their mom's basement. Like, if you're writing stuff in a genre and you aren't successful, this is a, a side note, then you are really, really doing things wrong. Like, a lot of us here are doing poetry or literary fiction and the audience is not there. But selling books in the major genres is really just like a math equation. And what's fun about writing online is that you don't have to have a deadline for your writing online or for your book. I was just thinking about this the other day because I'm building an audience online and I have direct response with readers and stuff. I was like, dude, I don't need to release my novel for years. I can just work on this and have fun with it. There's no pressure. And when I release it, it's going to be a, to a huge group of people. And I'm going to guarantee that it's good. I'm going to put it through the same process that all the novels behind me got. Because most of us actually really do need an editor. Most of us need to pay over $1,000 for a book cover and have it formatted correctly for it to be taken seriously. Because that's who we're competing against. And so I would say, and I always preach patience, you guys, that somehow, for some reason, people think I'm like full-time with this. And guys, I'm like nowhere close yet, like with being a full-time writer and being a full-time YouTuber. And I've been at this game. I've made over 600 videos now, and I've been doing this for at least five or six years. And so I would never tell you unless, that you, were, unless you were like a hot chick who was willing to talk about Cormac McCarthy and David Foster Wallace online that, you know, your success is going to be really fast and you'll figure this out in a year. You aren't. It, this is a three to 10 year process, but it is something that can be enjoyable, that you can do, that it doesn't need to be stressful. And you have an opportunity that Faulkner never had to connect with audiences and do things a little bit differently and applying Faulkner's logic, trying to look back and say, oh, 
I want to be like them when they didn't even have the same opportunities that we did is crazy because I think a lot of them, especially because they had that it factor, would take these opportunities that a lot of us refuse to take because we are romanticizing them. So thank you guys for being here. I love each and every one of you. Good luck writing today. Have fun reading. Go out and get some sunshine. Go find a wife. Go find a husband. Make it happen. And I will see you guys later.